Are you foolish for buying U.S. Treasuries? And is $34 trillion of U.S. debt really a problem? Hello, member super savers and bond course fans. I hope you're having a good week. And welcome to part two of our two-part Recession 2024 mini-series. So in part one, we talked about NVIDIA, U.S. Treasuries, and the American consumer. And we had a deeper look at this question. What has our country done right so far? And why hasn't a U.S. recession happened yet? I've linked part one in the video description below for those of you who want to refresh your memories or may have missed it. In part two, today's video, we'll be covering these additional questions. What could go wrong? How could the U.S. economy and the bond market stumble from here? Plus, are you foolish for buying U.S. Treasuries? And how are we changing our investment strategy going forward based on the findings from our Recession 2024 mini-series? As usual, here's our front of video disclaimer. For a detailed disclaimer, please refer to the end of this video. Let's dive in now, folks. As some of you may recall from part one of our two-part Recession 2024 mini-series, I shared with you how our country, the United States of America, has been the number one winner in the world economy over the past 20 years, leaving behind the European Union and Japan, and also keeping China at a distance. So, what's with the mixed messages then about the state of the U.S. economy, like in this recent Wall Street Journal article? America's economy is number one. That means trouble. Well, here's the thing. Even though the U.S. is doing a lot of things right, even though America's economy is number one, and even though at the time of this taping, 12 out of the 15 most valuable companies worldwide, as measured by market capitalization, are American, we have a few stumbling blocks that we need to sort out. In our mind, mixed messages like this one here and much of the jitters and volatility we're seeing in the bond and equity markets from time to time can be attributed to what we refer to at Diamond Nest Egg as the three Ds of doom for our country. The three Ds that pose real threats to the health of the U.S. economy. The first D of doom for our country is our deficit or debt pile. Take your pick which D word you want to choose. So, in part one of our Recession 2024 mini-series, I talked about government spending from a positive lens, how government spending is stimulating investment and job growth in both the public and private sectors, and that these government deficits are actually one of the three fundamental reasons why U.S. recession has not happened yet. In part two of our Recession 2024 mini-series, in today's video, Let's talk about government spending from the flip side of the coin, so to speak, looking at the risks and negative side effects, because while it is spurring economic growth right now, the fact is that from a medium and long-term perspective, something will break. The U.S. deficit is running simply too high to be sustainable forever. Here are some slightly scary statistics from the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. For 2024, the federal government is forecast to have outlays or spend $6.5 trillion on revenues of $4.9 trillion, meaning every fourth dollar the federal government spends has to be borrowed. And the forecast going forward doesn't show much improvement. At current trends, the total federal deficit will remain more or less steady at around 6% of GDP for the next 10 years, until 2034. While the total federal debt held by the public would grow by 84% from $26.2 trillion to $48.3 trillion to a whopping 116% of the U.S. GDP by fiscal year 2034. Now... History has shown that a combination of loose fiscal policy, financial speak for too much government spending and borrowing, with a tight monetary policy, meaning high interest rates, can precipitate financial crises. 
High interest rates on U.S. Treasuries are good for those of us Diamond Nest Egg members, super savers, and bond course fans who are buying them. And if you're newer to us, you may want to check out our recently launched bond courses so that you can learn all about how to invest in bonds and how to build a bond portfolio while rates are still attractive. I've linked all the course information in the description and comments below. So, as I was saying, while high interest rates on U.S. Treasuries are good for Diamond Nest Egg members, super savers, and bond course fans, they are much less good for our government, which is paying out that interest expense. As you can see here from the $1 trillion projected increase in net interest expense over the next decade, from $659 billion in 2023 to an estimated $1.628 trillion in 2034. And in our view, a continuation down this path will not only put a severe strain on the federal budget, it will also lead to continued jitters and volatility in the bond market with possible spillover effects into equity and other markets. And by the way, as much as the market celebrates every CPI report that shows inflation is not accelerating, as they did with the latest report, all this debt, it's inflationary. It's hard for us at Diamond Nest Egg to see a non-bumpy road forward for inflation, interest rates, and the bond market so long as this ever-increasing debt trajectory continues. So, this first D of doom, our excessive deficit or debt pile, is this a risk that we probably have to live with for the foreseeable future? In the words of Yoda, unfortunate, but most likely unavoidable, this is. As you can see from this big green check mark. Because at this moment in time, neither the current administration nor any likely successor may do much about the deficit, which neatly transitions into the second D of doom for our country. Dysfunctional government. As we have all seen again in the recent struggle to pass a budget for the federal government for 2024, this has become a recurring challenge that seems to threaten us with a government shutdown almost every year. Even worse, it's not really a new development. As Mike Enzi, a former chair of the Senate Budget Committee, pointed out already almost 10 years ago, instead of a functioning appropriations process, Congress has resorted to massive omnibus appropriations bills and continuing resolutions that carry over spending from the previous year. This new norm of crisis budgeting reduces transparency, accountability, and certainty. Enzi was proposing to reform the budgeting process back then to the 115th U.S. Congress, which began in 2017. But the situation hasn't fundamentally changed. So it appears that this second D of doom, dysfunctional government, and living without proper budgets remains again a risk that we probably have to live with for the foreseeable future. As you can see from the second green check mark here. You should know, though, that according to some cynics, from a purely economic standpoint, government dysfunction might just keep the government from meddling with private enterprise too much, which could potentially turn out to not be such a bad thing for growth in the long run. And for this innovation that we talked about in part one of our two-part Recession 2024 miniseries, that's been the key reason why America is the number one world economy right now. After all, in the 19th century, when the U.S. federal government was following a laissez-faire policy that didn't intervene in the economy much, the U.S. made substantial economic progress overall and started growing into its current role as the world's preeminent economy. That said, the overall impressive growth in the 19th century came at the price of many often violent upswings and downswings. And while citizens may have appreciated the long-term improvement in living standards, they were certainly less happy about the not-so-infrequent short-term downturns or panics, as they used to be called. Now, only time will tell whether a government busy with itself will this time around just let the economy get on with innovation and growth, or whether this will not be enough to tackle the challenges ahead. Which brings us to the third D of doom, 
disruption of the U.S.-led world order by wars and or economic deglobalization. It seems that world trade volumes have recovered well from the initial sharp decline when COVID hit in 2020. And the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, currently predicts that global trade in goods and services will continue to grow at a respectable pace of slightly more than 3% for 2024 and 2025, which comes almost as a welcome surprise if we look at the current sources of global instability, even if we just mention Ukraine, the Middle East, and potential scenarios around Taiwan and North Korea. Of course, there might be more external shocks and threats emerging in the future that will test whether our federal government will be willing and able to manage the risks and threats in an effective and coherent way. Meaning again, this is a risk that we probably have to live with for the foreseeable future. So we now have all these green check marks here. The fact that we probably have to live with all three of these D's of doom for the foreseeable future. They paint a much less sunny picture than these three fundamental reasons why U.S. recession hasn't happened yet from part one of our Recession 2024 miniseries. And as a side remark, things are complex even if we just look at the deficits which appear on both the negative and the positive sides of the U.S. economic picture. So, where does that leave us then, right? And why is this column empty? Well, we'll need to move on to the next section of this video to complete the last column in this table. So, it seems the U.S. economy is finally slowing down a bit. Inflation has been moderating, the services sector is cooling, and wage growth has been coming down as well. And we'll need to see whether this will lead to the Fed cutting rates sooner rather than later, which in our opinion will not only depend on lower inflation and stable employment, but also on how the federal deficit will develop. In the worst of all worlds, we could even see a stagflationary scenario. But we're not that pessimistic, at least not yet. Here's our basic scenario at Diamond Nest Egg. First and foremost, the U.S. economy stands on a strong fundamental basis with its strength and in innovation, and we should continue to gain or at least maintain global market share in the medium and long term, especially as the other main global economies are facing challenges of their own. China's issues include a real estate bubble, a sharp slowdown in foreign and private investment, and a shrinking working age population. And the EU's issues include a weakness in innovation, their own demographic challenges, as well as geopolitical proximity to Ukraine and the Middle East. However, we also think that the three D's of doom of a ballooning deficit, dysfunctional government, and potential disruption of the U.S.-led world order remain risks that we will probably have to live with for the foreseeable future and that may continue to drive ongoing market jitters and volatility. So, in our view, if there is a recession and or stock market downturn in late 2024 or 2025, which is not impossible, we assume that it will be neither too deep nor too long-lasting, as long as the fundamental comparative strengths of the U.S. economy remain intact and we manage the threats from the three Ds of doom more or less effectively. Because despite what the doomsayers may want us to believe, our country is in a good starting position, even a very good starting position, as some might argue. America currently stands on top among the large economies of the world when you look at our share of world gross domestic product. When you look at our GDP per head and when you look at our innovative companies that dominate the markets globally. Plus, all three of these D's of doom, they should be fixable or at least manageable. In fact, these first two Ds, deficit and dysfunctional government, are fully in our control as a country to manage and mitigate. No external factors would prevent us from bringing down the deficit and reforming the way we govern to make it more functional. And this last D, disruption of the U.S.-led world order, 
Well, our country is not a passive player on the world stage either. And while others, not least China, will have a strong say in how the world order will develop over the next few years, the U.S. as the number one global economy may also just remain that decisive power that can either allow this disruption to happen or take a leadership role to maintain stability and help make the world at least a little bit of a better place, provided we can muster our will and have a functional and effective government. So let's put a diamond nest egg yellow question mark here for now. In our mind, it should at least in theory actually be much easier for us to fix or manage these three D's of doom than for any of these countries here to suddenly out innovate us and catch up in economic terms, so to say, at least for the foreseeable future. And while I'm not as optimistic as Warren Buffett's never bet against America camp, I am overall pretty America optimistic, albeit in the more realistic Winston Churchill camp. Americans will always do the right thing only after they've tried everything else. Which camp do you fall into? More Warren Buffett or Winston Churchill? Or are you fundamentally more pessimistic when you look at the current state of the nation and the world? Drop a comment below and let everyone know. And in case you fall into the America will default on its debt camp, then check out these member videos linked below. Because my standard assumption for U.S. Treasuries has not changed. It is still a no default scenario at the current time. Is $34 trillion of U.S. debt a problem? Yes, it is. If it continues to grow at the current pace. And if innovation and growth were to suddenly stall in the U.S., the deficit could become a really serious issue really fast. Because a growing economy can support a large debt pile much more easily than a stagnant one. But are deficit and debt fixable in principle? Yes, they are, provided we can overcome our dysfunctional government. And with so many investors, both at home and abroad, buying U.S. Treasuries and investing in our innovative American companies, I would say that I'm not the only one that is America optimistic around the world. Which brings us to... What's our investment strategy going forward based on the findings from this Recession 2024 mini-series? Let's start with what stays the same. First, we will continue to auto-roll some of our emergency savings and non-retirement savings in T-bills while making sure to have a bit of dry powder around in case market opportunities come along. Everyone's financial journey is different, but in my mind, investing in the safest, most liquid fixed income investment in the world, meaning U.S. Treasuries as an overall category and at current rates, would not exactly look like a stupid thing to do at this point in time. Second, we will continue to add tips and I-bonds to our overall portfolio so long as real yields stay roughly where they are because it is, in our mind, always a good idea to have some inflation protection in a portfolio that will have to support us for the next few decades. You never know how inflation will develop over the long run. And even in the short term, as I mentioned earlier, we may not always see a smooth path forward for inflation if our current debt trajectory continues. Bond course fans, I encourage you to revisit Module 6 on tips and Module 7 on I-bonds in Bond Beginners, as well as these modules in Bond Masters to figure out what bond laddering strategies, portfolio allocations, and decumulation options may best suit your age and stage of life. Third, we will continue to dollar cost average our long-term retirement savings into equity funds that invest in innovative American companies like these here, as well as other sectors that I feel are poised for growth. So I'm sure some of our diamond nest egg regulars are wondering what's changed. The one real thing that has changed as a result of the findings from our recession 2024 mini series is that we're allocating even more of our total portfolio into the U.S. From our standpoint, there isn't really a case currently for aggressive international diversification into other financial markets, which are generally less liquid and often less developed than the U.S. And as we just discussed in our two videos, less innovative and have a lower growth potential. 
So what about you? What does your portfolio look like? And what kind of bonds and or equities are you buying or planning on buying? As usual, leave a comment below and let everyone know. All right, members, super savers and bond course fans, I hope you enjoyed our two-part recession 2024 mini series. And if you did, I'd love to invite you to take a look at this video here on one of our two brand new bond courses so that you can take advantage of some of the current rates on those U.S. Treasuries and other fixed income products as well. Or join our next live bond course and member sessions in June to continue the discussions. Check out the links below this video for more details on our bond courses and YouTube Super Super Saver membership. See you again very soon with more brand new wealth building content for your financial journey.